Hi, everyone, and welcome. It's time for another ICBA cast. I'm Jordan Bateman, Vice President of Communications for the Independent Contractors and Businesses Association, the mighty ICBA, joined by Chris Gardner, President of ICBA. And my malfunctioning television screen behind me. Apologies, we are the men in black today. That was very creative. Yeah, thank you. ICBA is the, uh, well, it's the best construction association. We represent 2,300 members and clients. Uh, we do everything from training and advocacy and benefit services. Uh, working hard on behalf of 250,000 men and women in construction in British Columbia and beyond. All right, Chris. Okay. We haven't talked since Tech Frontier pulled their application for an oil sands mine. Right. There is now talk that that might be the final nail in the oil sands major project coffin. Uh, since then, um, the protests have continued. The legislature is closed to the public for the sixth consecutive day because of protests. Um, there is little or no progress on the uh, coastal gas link, but the federal minister for, uh, do they still call it Indian Affairs? I think they do. No. Which, uh, or Indigenous Crown Reconciliation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, until like three years ago it was that, which is crazy. Uh, and then uh, Indigenous Relations Minister for uh, British Columbia, they go to uh, meet with the, uh, the Wet'suwet'en Hereditary Chiefs yeah. to broker a deal to get the pipeline moving and... Pipeline's not moving. Pipeline's not moving. They are not, uh, they apparently negotiated everything except, you know, the pipeline access, uh, access for construction workers to the pipeline. John Horgan says construction can continue. The hereditary, hereditary chiefs say nothing's changed. It can't continue. The protests uh, continue across the country. What the hell is happening in this country, Chris? <laughs> okay, so let's back up to the tech decision to, okay. uh, to not proceed with their $21 billion investment mm -hmm. into our energy economy. Um, it, that's troubling on a number of levels because, first of all, it is one in a series of successive projects that have been either delayed or yeah. effectively canceled. And you can go right back to Northern Gateway, mm -hmm. um, then you go to Energy East, yeah. then you go to Keystone, uh, and then there'll be a whole raft of other projects that aren't as high profile that have just not come to fruition. Several LNG projects in yeah. BC. Yeah. So the problem is that if you read the, the CEO, Don Lindsay, uh, wrote a letter uh, on the day that they uh, withdrew their application. Mm -hmm. And th there was a, a, a term he used. He said, we do not see a constructive path forward mm -hmm. to get this project approved. So if you don't, th that's actually quite alarming to have a senior, ex the CEO of one of the biggest uh, mining companies in the world yeah. say that looking to make an investment of, of major proportions, $21 billion, into Canada. There isn't a constructive path to get this project approved. And, and so that, that's troubling. And so what's happened as a result is that investment and opportunity are leaving Canada. Mm -hmm. The CEO of the World Bank of Canada said last year that Canada has lost over $100 billion in investment over the last two years because we simply take too long to get projects approved. There's no clear path to get a project mm -hmm. approved. And when the project is approved, which is really what the, the point of the tech project is, um, and Coastal Gas Link, mm -hmm. is that the approval effectively means nothing. Uh, it's not something that a, a, an investor, a company can say, we've got our approval, we've got our permits, we can start construction, we can take this to the bank, we can go. No, you can't do that. No. And it's become abundantly clear that governments, Victoria and Ottawa in this case, um, are not prepared uh, to really stand behind their own approval processes yep. and the companies that have spent years and years and years. Remember, these projects, if you look at Transmount, it's, it's a decade of, mm -hmm. of going through an approval process. Same with Energy, uh, same with LNG Canada, same with Site C. A decade of trying to get a project approved. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we're no further along. The Coastal Gas Link is just mind-boggling to me because here is this is the feeder pipeline of natural gas to LNG Canada. Mm -hmm. um, if there is a quote-unquote spill along the pipeline, it's gas. It merely evaporates into the air. It's not a spill like crude oil. Like this is right. a no-brainer. Um, it brings down emissions in China, which you know we're a, a global economy. We should be worried about global emissions. Everything check, checks off, but you know, these protesters who frankly care very little about the wet sweat and, and even less about the hereditary chiefs, really it's about oil and gas and, and fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, they've paralyzed, you know, like it's been six days and the public haven't had access to the legislature, their own house of government. Like it's mind boggling that you're doing question period. Like 
you know, I haven't talked to any of the MLAs there. I'd be curious what, you know, folks like, it must be like theater of the absurd. You're, you're there debating these bills. There's no one in the gallery because the public's not allowed to enter. That's right. And, and listen, uh, the protests, the, pro expressing your views mm -hmm. uh, for or against something is the cornerstone of, 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 of a democracy. And, yes. and, and so there's no question that people um, can, can disagree with, with a direction government's going in or with, with other issues that are in the public policy realm. And protesting is part of that. But the protests mm -hmm. should not be um, holding an entire a national economy uh, or communities up to ransom. Right. The protests should occur in parks, in squares, in areas where they are not going to shut down rail lines, yep. shut down ports, um, with the intention of disrupting um, uh, people trying to you know, do nothing more than go about their daily jobs and support their families. So when the West Coast Express yeah. uh, was canceled and at the end of a workday, the, the hundreds of people, the thousands, who would show up to get on the, on the, on the, uh, on the train, uh, were told to go into, they had to get on buses and then go to Coquitlam and then take a bus somewhere else, get on a second bus. And so those people are not, the, but the only thing they're thinking about is they're, they're, very fr they're angry and they're frustrated. Yeah. You're not creating this environment for a constructive dialogue. And on the constructive dialogue, the second important point here is that this is really, this is a very small group, uh, minority group within the Wet'suwet'en of individuals, in, uh, even among the hereditary chiefs, who, who do not, who did not support, sign on to support the project. Yeah. So you've got, so everybody came around the table yep. to have a constructive discussion. 20 out of 20 First Nations along that pipeline route signed benefit agreements with Coastal Gas. 43 out of 43 on Trans Mountain, mm -hmm. whose territories are intersected by the pipeline, have signed uh, benefit agreements with Trans Mountain. So that's 100% consensus. Yeah. Um, it's hard to get more than 100%. Yes. And so... But there, apparently we demand it. Well, you know, there is an obligation for government yeah. to stand up for the private sector companies that have been dealing in good faith mm -hmm. uh, and negotiating good faith. For the other First Nations who've signed agreements, for the th hundreds and thousands of employees who are Indigenous and non-Indigenous whose livelihoods depend on these projects, it is not good enough to stand back and say, well, we'll just I, hope that the protests subside. Yeah. Um, or to do nothing, and uh, that's unfortunately where we are. And so what we're seeing is the potential for supply chain disruption on a fairly significant scale. Mm -hmm. And some of our members are starting to raise questions to us and saying, listen, we're concerned about the shipment of materials coming. So for example, a number of our glass members of our, our uh, ICBA who, are gl who provide glass for uh, buildings, mm -hmm. uh, the glass is stuck in the harbor on, on a boat that can't be offloaded. We've got a number of our rebar members. The rebar is not be, is being delayed and getting offloaded. Yep. So all of those things. Uh, lighting mechanisms as well. Remember yeah, it, yeah. It, it's it's it all it, one. It adds to the delays in projects. Mm -hmm. uh, it adds to the increase in costs. Um, so we talk about affordability. There's a ripple effect to the economy. People are left uh, out of work, uh, uh, not working because of these disruptions. And so, whose responsibility is it to keep our economy going forward? And it is that of the government. That is yep. why they are elected. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Um, and now you have the the secret backroom deal hatched with the uh, the wet sweat and hereditary chiefs, and the hereditary chiefs have been given weeks to go back to their small uh, group of uh, small First Nation and talk about this deal. But the government won't release to the Canadian public what this deal is, except to say it has nothing to do with the pipeline, which leads to a lot of questions. You talk about the cornerstone of democracy being you know the ability to to peacefully dissent, absolutely. But it's also the cornerstone, another cornerstone of democracy is majority rule. Another cornerstone is openness and transparency. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of appalling that, you know, like 300 people will be able to see this agreement that affects them very much so, but also affects British Columbia Canadians and they're left in the dark. It, it's kind of crazy. It's just a, it, it's a strange thing to see them you know, make a big deal about these these talks and then not actually deliver on the burning issue facing the country. Well, and the comments coming out of the hereditary chiefs is that they still don't support the pipeline. No. Um, and they're not suggesting that the protests stop because they don't want to tell other protesters not to protest. Right. So uh, we don't <sighs> know what the government's, uh, the federal and provincial government's got out of the negotiations. 
Um, Nothing. But it would not appear to be helpful to coastal gas. No. All right. Uh, on the bright side, John Horgan's personal popularity. Corinne Angus Reid is now dipped below 50%. He's down 10 points since this pipeline uh, debacle uh, began, uh, the protest debacle began. Um, and I think that's pretty fair. He's been pretty poor at handling this thing. Well, and I, I, people are frustrated. Yeah. Uh, and they're looking for leadership from Victoria and Ottawa. Yeah. Uh, they want to be able to uh, go to their places of work. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to commute. They want to be able to get the goods out of our ports. Uh, they want to get the, the, rail, the railways working again. Uh, and running on time. And, you know, it's not just, like, it's construction that's impacted. It's the agricultural community that's impacted. You know, a supply chain of materials uh, impacts every segment it's of our the building. Economy. It's a building block for the economy. I that's mean, right. it's, you have to have access to these types of things. So down 10 points looks good on John Horgan. Uh, Horgan's also taking a beating because a lot more detail has come out of the budget, things that they hid away that, you know, reporters have been ferreting out. And turns out, this budget includes a number of cuts to very odd areas, including yeah. BC Transit, cuts to yeah. meat and health safety inspectors, like things that you would think you'd want to at least keep stable. Like Well, <laughs> certainly things that you would have thought this government would have yeah. supported, uh, given their uh, their policy orientation. And, and you know, it's, 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 so one, I think um, it, that just got, got lost in the, in all of the press around the, um, uh, both the protests and now the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that, you know, in so many areas, they're over, you know, if you look at the, the community benefit agreements, where effectively they're freezing out 85% of construction workers. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, uh, if you're not a member of the building trades unions, one of those 19 unions that cut a backroom deal with this government uh, to secure monopoly and all the work on publicly funded infrastructure, um, that is hundreds of millions of dollars that they will overpay for those infrastructure projects, as a, as and effectively that money will uh, flow to uh, the members of the building trades unions and through dues up to the building trades unions, um, that's the hundreds of millions of dollars that could have been used to prevent the cuts in the areas that they've cut from. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Well, exactly, and you know you have a budget that's still balanced but on a knife's edge, less uh, contingency than they had last year. And no contemplation whatsoever in the budget on an economic slowdown mm -hmm. uh, internationally. No contemplation in the budget about what happens if a Bernie Sanders gets elected in November, which would send the U.S. markets into free fall. And no contemplation whatsoever on the effects of the coronavirus, which, um, Chris, uh, I know it's a bit of a hobby. Uh, Chris will often text me uh, articles. Lately, they've all been coronavirus-related. Um, this is now coming home to Canada. This is coming to Canada. It you know, popped up uh, in a weird way on a Burnaby construction site, turned out to be a false alarm, but still kind of shows just how damaging this uh, could be to the economy as a whole. Yeah, you know, and that, that happened last week, Thursday and Friday, 500 construction workers had to go home. Part, and, and you know, there was a worker who was suspected of having the virus, and in the end he did not have it. He had flu-like symptoms, which, okay. you know, he coughed, he was coughing, and so he goes to see his uh, construction safety officers, as you're supposed to do when you're sick on a site. They treat him, they send him to hospital, and then they have to go into self-quarantine because, you know, until they know whether or not he has the coronavirus or not, they could be infected. So they go home to be in quarantine for 14, up to 14 days. Um, you know, fortunately, yesterday it was dis discovered that uh, he had tested negative for the virus. It was just a cold or a flu. Um, great. Yeah. Everyone's back to work. But, you know, it does show, like, if construction sites or other places start to shut down, workplaces start to shut down, or you have to self-quarantine, um, this is going to be... It's going to be a big hit. Yeah, you know, it was it was shut down for two days. That's that's 500 workers out of out of work for two days. Mm -hmm. um, and to your point, if this starts to ripple through workplaces, uh, more people working from home, uh, people who, um, who maybe can't work um, because they they're unable to work from home. You can't be on a construction site and home at the same time. Mm -hmm. What will be the ripple effects to the economy? A lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainties. Markets have been going up and down. Um, so. The Federal Reserve in the U.S. cut uh, interest rates by uh, 50 basis points yeah. uh, today. So it's going to be interesting. I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Obviously, the overlying message is don't, nobody should be panicking. Mm -hmm. And the one thing everybody should be doing is washing their hands frequently. Yeah. That is the best. Don't touch your face. And don't touch, don't your touch face. other people's faces. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, uh, th then we should be fine. And, and obviously, they're working on a vaccine. That's a little ways off. But yeah. nonetheless, um, 
Yeah, I think there's going to be some disruption. Was, you know, the travel industry is, is facing that right now. Hotels, airlines. Yeah, cruises. Uh, yeah, so um, it's going to be interesting. We're watching it closely from the perspective of whether construction sites. Now, a lot of construction sites are outside. They're mm -hmm. in weather. Um, that makes it difficult to transmit a virus. Yeah. You're, you're wearing gloves, safety gear. You're outside. There's wind. There's rain. The it also makes it easier to get colds and flus, and That's people right. go... You know, what's right. the difference in the uh, in the symptoms? So, so don't don't cough in public. Well, I mean that's yeah that's problematic, right? So you know the uh, Journal of Commerce called. We did uh, and asked us what we were doing to educate members. Um, you know, frankly, we're doing what school districts, what other employers are doing, and that's you know relying on the experts right. to to tell you and err on the side of caution. Um, but yeah, it's it's problematic, and again, it's another wrinkle in the supply chain because you know fewer goods are coming out of China uh, or out of Asia. Uh, that's that's the thing. Well, my least favorite thing about the coronavirus is the sanctimonious British Columbians, so who will say things, tweet things like, um, "British Columbian has British Columbia has tested more people for the coronavirus than all of the United States." Y here's the thing, guys. We've got to quit comparing our healthcare system to the United States. And you need to start comparing to the rest of the world that does better than both, right? Yeah. Like South Korea has drive-through corona testing things. So if you feel sick, you don't even have to get out. You don't get out of your car. You go from your house into your car. You drive through. They test you. Off you go back to your home. Like that is what you want. And they've done, you know, tens of thousands of tests this way. Um, that to me is like, okay, that's an innovative way of trying to treat this, uh, trying to get a handle on this rather than, oh, well, you know aren't we great? We've done, you know, a thousand tests and America's only done 820. Like, that is not the kind of metric we want to be uh, relying yeah. on. That's right. Uh, do you want to tell your uh, TNT story or your Whole Foods story or whatever? Well, you know, it is interesting how... H -mart. Well, I, I did think it was curious that the Federal Minister of Health uh, last week made an announcement about making sure that people start stocking up on provisions. Yeah. That's usually not a message that, that you hear coming from government. But there is some interesting pictures now circulating where you know, larger stores have got empty shelves because mm -hmm. people are going into buying can more canned goods, more rice. I happen to be going to uh, H Mart downtown and in the section where they usually have, you know, a lot of different varieties and bags of, of rice, um, I would say it was 80% sold out. Hmm. Um, and the person in front of me had four big bags of rice. Yeah. So there is that knock-on effect of people, I think, concerned about having to self-quarantine for two weeks. Right. Will they have enough? Um, to, uh, yeah. Or um, like for us, we were more. I was kind of worried about okay, if everyone else rushes on the grocery right. store, like is there stuff available that we need? So, you know, this grocery shopping trip, I bought a few extra things. Like, you know, we had two thirds of a bag of rice left. Normally, you'd wait another couple of weeks. We bought an extra bag of rice. So you you're know? okay. You know, we bought an extra couple of things of marinara sauce and a couple extra boxes of pasta and just sort of you know little things here and there just just in case things that we're going to use anyways but right. you know but that is another problem is uh, you know by encouraging people to stock up you actually don't give the system the time it needs in order right. to constantly refuel um, so that is a that is a problem as well okay uh, Chris you were supposed to be in Fort St. John actually you're supposed to be on a plane to Fort St. John as we speak That's right but our, our friend Rex Murphy, we, was, uh, we were presenting at a sold-out event tomorrow night in Fort St. John. He uh, fell ill. Now, not the coronavirus, just not the virus, the flu. And but did not travel, and we had to cancel that event. But uh, yeah, disappointing. Uh, yeah, obviously we want Rex to get back uh, to uh, to health as soon. Fighting as for him. Can. We need right. him. Canada needs him. Um, but yeah, we had 400 people um, at an event, and uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, there's some logistics and canceling and unwinding all of that. We're doing that, and obviously, anyone who bought tickets is getting a full refund. Yeah. Uh, those who sponsor, we're giving them uh, a full refund as well. Yeah. And so uh, we're managing that, but uh, you know, obviously, our thoughts are with Rex, and uh, hopefully, he's back uh, in uh, and able to travel soon. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, that's it for uh, us on the ICB cast. We will be back in a couple of weeks, and then uh, Chris, we're going to Nashville. It's going to be great. I, so the tornadoes are condolences to the folks uh, who are dealing with that in Nashville. We're headed there for a uh, construction conference uh, end of March, which will be my first time in Nashville. Have you ever been to Nashville? No, never been. So yeah, it'll be, be kind of, be it'll be exciting. So uh, we'll try to get in an ICB cast before then. I believe session ends this week for a couple weeks. So uh, there'll be hopefully some uh, legislation to talk about. All right. Excellent. That's it. Thank Take you. Care. Have a good day.